Sweet School on RealArtCulture.com is brought to you by Syngenta Canada, Alberta Wheat Commission, and CNM Seeds. Real Agriculture comes to you today from the CNM Industry Day, and I'm joined by Patty Townsend, the CEO of the Canadian Seed Trade Association. Patty, thanks and welcome to Real Agriculture. Thank you. 26 days and probably about seven hours left, not that I'm counting. Yeah. Anyway. After eight years uh, on the job, uh, you're going to try something a little different, but you still still got a job to do with plant breeders' rights, right? We do. A lot of the job is done, but there's still a lot to be done. And what really needs to be done is to help people in the value chain to understand, first of all, what the benefits are of the new plant breeders' rights and also what their new obligations might be wherever they are on the value chain. So let's talk about that. Obviously, we've got new plant breeders' rights, so UPOV 91. Let's just go back a little bit. Let's talk about you know why we need plant breeders' rights. Plant breeders, right, first of all, it takes about, for an average variety that's developed conventionally, it'll take anywhere from, you know, eight to ten years to develop that variety and up to and over a million dollars to develop it. So it's a big investment. It's very expensive to bring a new variety. The, the difference between plant varieties and other inventions is that plant varieties are really, really easily and actually quite commonly copied. It's grain. You plant it, it grows. It, you plant it, it grows. And it's very easy to copy, so it's very difficult for a breeder to recover their investment. And the way that they do that is they protect their intellectual property with a tool like Plant Breeders' Rights so that they can generate a royalty that compensates them for their investment and allows them to reinvest in developing new varieties. And that's the key here, right? Giving people confidence to to invest. And, that's right. And, and that means a lot because with investment, that's tremendous return for the industry and for growers. That's right. If you don't have the money to invest, you're not going to develop the new varieties. Your growers aren't going to get the new varieties. They're not going to get the yields or the new attributes to allow them to take advantage of new market demands. And your industry just slows and stops and in some cases falls behind. Hmm. So let's talk about why amend the old act and go, and go to UPOV 91. Why, why, why do it? Because Canada, but before we amended our act and before we became UPOP 1991 compliant, we were one of three developed countries that was not. And that meant that there were almost 80 different countries around the world trading genetics and sending genetics to other countries, knowing that they could protect it in the same way in all of those countries but they couldn't protect it that way in Canada. And breeders who were looking for places to develop and to invest were not going to invest in Canada because they could not protect their, their varieties the same way as they could in other countries. Some of them chose to build brand new facilities in Australia and other countries. And we actually had letters from Europeans, for example, who said, no, you're not getting our superior varieties because we can't protect them. Mm -hmm. So it was really, really important for us to bring it, bring ourselves up to in line with the rest of the world so that we could give that signal that we are open for investment. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about a, four, four, a few of the key areas and the difference between 91 and 78. And let's start it off with the, uh, the breeder's right. The breeder under 1978, uh, the 1978 convention, only really had authority over two things, and that was to sell and to produce. And so what that meant was that once the, the product was grown and it was sold, there was really no authority. So many things could happen and that seed could get used in lots of different ways and the breeder got no compensation. Under 1991, the breeder now has expanded authority. So they, they now have, you have to have the permission of the breeder to produce, reproduce, to sell, to um, stock or, or uh, store, to condition, so condition or clean, to export, to import. So it gives them a lot more authority and not a lot more places where they can find the people that are cheating yeah. and where they can get compensation. Let's talk about the protection period. Now, has that been extended? Well, the protection period's been extended, so from 18 years to 20 years, but really probably more than half of the varieties that are granted plant breeders' rights, even under the old act, didn't go for their full period. One of the really big important things about protection period is, under the new act, once you apply for a plant breeder's right, you're protected. And uh, you can be protected up to when it gets the plant breeders' right. You can't take legal action if you find an infringement in that, that year, but you can after. So it's called provisional protection, and it's really important because you apply for a plant breeders' right, and it can take quite a while before you can actually get the right. Now let's talk about the, the farmer's exception, a big 
topic of conversation with farm yeah. groups and, and seed sales. Yes. So under the old act, it didn't say you couldn't save grain to use as seed on your farm. So if it didn't say you couldn't, that meant you could. Under the new act, it actually says that farmers have an exception. So farmers can produce, reproduce, condition, stock or store for use on their own farm, harvested material to use on their farms. And the final thing I want to touch on was really that compensation on harvest of the material. Who's going to get paid and who needs to get paid? If the breeder hasn't had the ability to be compensated or hasn't given the authority for the use of the seed, so if the seed was acquired illegally, the breeder can now seek compensation on the harvested material or the grain. What that really means is that if you acquired some of my variety illegally and you grew grain and you sold that grain and I can prove that that seed was acquired illegally, I can get compensation on the grain. So on all of that grain that you've delivered, I can get compensated on that. And it's not just the loss of the royalty, it's lost market opportunity, it's court costs, it's lost markets and the loss of the royalty. So they can be some pretty big compensations awarded. Mm -hmm. And there have been over $200,000 compensations awarded. Wow. Now, you, we talked about it earlier, a big topic with a lot of implications for a lot of people around, along the, the value chain, and it behooves everybody to get into this and figure out what's the impact on themselves. And it's also really important for everybody on the value chain to understand their impact, but also to communicate that, because we all need to understand it. And the best thing that you can do is keep really, really good records. Always start out with certified seed and always keep that record so that you can prove that you acquired that seed legally. Do not sell farm saved seed. That's illegal. That's always been illegal. Don't go and, and exchange your farm saved seed for a service or something like that because that's a sale and that's illegal and pretty well has always been illegal. But the most important thing for everybody along the value chain is to keep your records and to always, always be able to track your grain or your seed back to that original purchase of, of certified seed. Awesome. Well, Patty, thank you for your time today. A big issue, a big topic, lots of understanding, lots of learning and uh, some great insights. Thanks so much. Thank and you. 27 days left. <laughs> at, the, at the helm of uh, CSTA, uh, good luck in the future. Well, I'm sure we'll see you around. Going to ride off into the sunset. Thanks.